Good morning. It is good to be here this morning. I appreciate so much uh, the privilege that it is to be here and speak with you this morning that uh, your pastor, Dr. Greer, has entrusted me uh, to open God's word with you from this pulpit this morning. Speaking of Dr. Greer, I texted back and forth with him this morning, and he asked me to pass along to you that after thus far in their series of peace rallies, that there have been 232 people saved. Yeah. You can see on the screen up there, Pastor, in his usual laid-back way, preaching. And he said this morning, if I understood him correctly, they got 50 of these people who'd been saved together and baptized them. Can you imagine 50 people being baptized? That's a wonderful thing, and I want to thank you all on his behalf for being so generous in your giving to the World Missions Offering, because it's through those offerings that we can place people on the field like that. We just had a team return from Idaho. We've got a team going to Wyoming, and of course this team in Uganda. So uh, keep, always keep that in mind as you give because you see real tangible results from your giving to these missions. You know, this morning, if I had an opportunity to speak to any one of those 232 people that were saved under our pastor's preaching, I would encourage them to read their Bible and I would offer them up a number of different passages that they might find useful, one of which is the psalm that we're going to be looking at today, Psalm 139. Because when we read this psalm, at least I'm filled with a sense of wonder, a sense of awe with regard to this God that we have, this God that we serve, this God who saves us through his son Jesus Christ, if we will be if we will but repent and place our faith and trust in him. You know, it's almost like after reading this psalm and contemplating on it, you have this sense of who, who is this God? How can he be so great? Who, who is this guy? I mean, it reminds me, uh, now, it, you know, my, my friends at the other campus tell me the only type of movies that I know are old movies, Okay. So how many of you have ever seen the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? You all remember that one? Okay, it's good to see there's some few folks in my generation here. Well, the thing, if you recall, about that movie is that Butch and Sundance are really good train robbers. In fact, they're so good at robbing trains that the railroad companies lose faith in the law enforcement and they hire their own posse to come together and track these guys down. Well, Butch and Sundance, they try every trick in the book. They'll ride double. They'll ride across rocks. They'll ride through the water. They'll do everything in the world to try to throw these guys off their trail. And the refrain that you hear, especially from Butch, over and over, in the middle part of that movie, you see him and Sundance, they'll look down to where that posse is tracking them, and everything that they do to try to lose them, to try to hide, to try to run away, they overcome. And Butch says, who are these guys? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, that's kind of the sense that we get this morning in reading this psalm. Who is this guy? Who's this God that we serve? How can he be as great as what he is? We're going to start in verse 1 of the 139th Psalm, and we'll go maybe a word or two or a whole verse or maybe two or three verses at a time. Just kind of stay with me. We'll get there, okay? <clears throat> the very first thing that we see is David addressing the creator of the universe. And how do we know that? It's because it's in all caps in your translation. That is Yahweh, the name of the Lord that the Hebrew people were afraid to speak because they didn't want to make a mistake somehow, and they were so reverent of his name, <coughs> it was represented by Yahweh. That's who David is speaking to here. He's writing to the creator God of the universe, and he says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. Well, that word searched 
has the connotation in the Hebrew not of just like, you know, you had somebody there you see on the TV shows where they have them spread their arms and they pat them down. It, it, it's much more involved than that. The word investigate is the one that comes to mind. Investigate. You have looked thoroughly at my background. You have talked to other people. You have investigated. You've looked everywhere there is to look and you know me not only do you know me notice the tense of the verb known me that indicates this is an ongoing from time immemorial through time to be forever in the future you have known me look what else he says you know when I sit down and when I stand up in other words what he's saying with these words you know every action I take Nothing is hidden from you. Everything that I do, you see. And this next one should, re it, this next one caught me up short. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all of my ways. How many of my ways is he aware of? Some of them? All. How much is all? All is all. You know, you might try reading this if you want to personalize it because this is very personal with David. Everywhere you see a personal pronoun, I, me, or mine, put your name in there, to where um, this next sentence that I read, I'm going to put my name in, you put your name in as you read it to yourself. To yourself. Before a word is on Richard's tongue, you know all about it lord now that caught me up short maybe it'll catch you up short that before i even speak a word he is aware of what i'm going to speak let that sink in for a minute there's been times that i've been driving with my grandkids in the car and our pastors talked about in the past about road rage and there have been times I've bit my tongue so my grandkids don't hear grandpa saying something he shouldn't say. Well, that might fool the grandkids, but did it fool the God who created me? Not according to this. He knows before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it. You have encircled me. You have placed your hand on me. This wondrous knowledge is beyond me. It is lofty. I am unable to reach it. David is in such awe of this creator that it's hard for him to even describe it. That's how awe-inspiring this God is. The, the big church word for this is omniscient. He knows everything about everything at all times. I guess I got my introduction to omniscient years and years ago when I thought my dad was omniscient let me tell you why I thought he was omniscient how many of you in here ever had a BB gun any of you ever have I've still got the BB gun that I got in third grade at Christmas and it still works and I was a terror with that BB gun let me tell you Around our farm, there wasn't a trash bird. Now, that, my folks considered sparrows and starlings to be trash birds, and I had free reign to shoot as many of those as I could. However, there were birds that my parents referred to as songbirds that my dad promised he would wrap that BB gun around a tree if I ever killed a songbird. So I knew that there were serious sanctions if I killed a songbird. So one day... I'm going to go out and walk around the farm with my trusty BB gun and try, strike terror into the hearts of all those trash birds. And I step outside, and about 75 yards away down to the barn, there's a grove of trees. There's some big cottonwoods that were kind of tall. And up in the top of those cottonwoods were some birds just kind of flying from limb to limb, just as birds will do when they're, you know, kind of playing around, that sort of thing. So me and my <clears throat> mature 10-year-old mind cocked my BB gun, put it on the pad of my leg right here, and just kind of aimed it in their general direction and pulled the trigger, thinking, 
I might hit a limb or something that might make a sound and cause them to fly away or something like that. Well, as the Lord would have it, one of those birds, and I'm telling you, this, the, the gun should not have even been able to, to, to have <coughs> impacted that bird at all. But one of those birds goes, boom, right down on the ground. What was my first reaction? Go tell my dad maybe I'd done something wrong. Oh, no. I ran down to pick up that bird, and you know what it was? It was a robin. I knew that my life was soon to be over if he found out. So I looked around real quick. No dad, no mom, nobody else. I picked that bird up, and I ran to the hog pen. Now, if you grew up on a farm, you know you just know why I took that bird and threw it over in the hog pen. If you weren't raised on a farm and you want to know why, see me afterwards. I'm not going to go into that right now. But I threw it over to the hog pen. I looked around. No dad. I thought I'm good. So I walk around a little bit more with my BB gun, go into the house, and there stands dad. He said, son, anything you need to tell me? Now, I am still so dense that I think I can pull this off. No, Dad, I, I don't have anything to tell you. He leans over to me and he says, what about that robin that you just killed? See, I didn't see my daddy, but my daddy saw me. And guys, there are things that we do in our life. There's our thoughts, our actions, that we think we can hide from our Lord and Savior. And we can't because he's omniscient. He knows everything at all times about each one of us. Now the scariest part of that is for some of you who've never repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he knows that too. And he knows that that sin separates you from him. For those of us that have placed our faith and trust in him, it is still a very sobering thing to realize that there's nothing that we can hide from him. There's no word that we could hide from him. There's no thought that we can hide from him. Guys, I know I just said thoughts, but think about it. There is no thought that he is not aware of. He is God, and that's who we serve. And that either brings comfort to us or it brings conviction. Let's go on here, verse 7 through 12. David shifts gears from how God knows things to where God is. He says, where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If, if I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. We can't go anywhere that God is not there. Now, don't confuse this with some modern heresies, some modern quote-unquote religions that say that God is in everything, that <clears throat> God is in the rocks and the trees and the animals and that sort of thing. That's not what he's saying here because that's not who God is. I am standing right here next to this table. I'm here with this table, but I'm not in it. God is here with us, <clears throat> but he may not be in you if you've not received him as your savior but he's surely not in that table all right so everywhere that we go god is there whether it's <coughs> excuse me the highest heavens or the lowest places of the earth god is there now again that can either be a comfort for us or that can be convictional for us because there are times when we think that we're all alone. Aren't there times when we think that we're all alone? Bad things happen. Tragedies happen in our life. Tragedies happen at work. And we think we're there by ourselves. But we're not. God is there. God is there with us. And maybe we think, well, I can run somewhere to hide from God. I, I can go somewhere where God isn't. That won't work. Because God is there regardless of where you go. If I fly on the wings of the dawn and settle down on the western horizon, even there your hand will lead me, your right hand will hold on to me. 
as is common in Scripture, there are two levels of things here. Not only is this saying that God is around morning and evening, 24 hours a day, but this is symbolic language that says from the beginning of time, the wings of the dawn, from the beginning of time you're there until I settle on the western horizon, until my day is done. All my life, God, you are around. And all we have to do is call upon him. That's what David's trying to get across to us. Is comfort, but as well, caution. Look at this. Look at this. Even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will hold on to me. Now, if you again, if you've not received him as your Savior, this isn't much comfort. But for those of us that have, think about this. God is there to hold on to us no matter in those darkest hours, in those times when we think we're alone, when tragedy strikes, when a loved one goes on home. He's there. He's with us. And he's a comfort to us. Isn't that a great thing to know? That his hand will hold on to me. Jesus echoed that in the book of John when he was in the high priestly prayer in chapter 17 where he talks about those that God has given me cannot be taken from my hand. Here we see it in the Old Testament. And then he goes on, he says, If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like day, darkness and light are alike to you. That means, in other words, you can't hide. You can't go so deep in the darkness of evil. You can't go so deep in the darkness of self, uh, you know, self that he can't find you and that you cannot at that point turn to him if you remember that he's there. There's no place that he's not. The big word for that, telling us he's already there, is that he is omnipresent. Everywhere you go, he's there. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere that we are. Look now, starting in verse 13. For it was you, again, he's speaking to this creator God. For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Look at that word, knit. That, again, is an intensely personal word. It shows God's activity. Not only that, the Hebrew word that's used there is more of the word that we would think of as embroidery. I can remember before Dee and I were married, she would make shirts for me. Generally, they were denim shirts, and she would embroider on them. And before you guys laugh... Back in the 70s, it was cool to have embroidered flowers on your shirt, okay? And Dee loved me enough that she would spend hours intently looking at that needlework in her hand, following that pattern, having it stretched out on a couple of hoops, and would sew thread at a time to make these flowers. That's the sense of this word knit. God knit us together. It's that personal. Each and every one of us, he put together that way. That's how personally involved he is with us. He said, I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. How else could we be made if God is the one doing the making? We have been made remarkably and wondrously. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. <coughs> Excuse me. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Let that sink in. He formed us, and all of our days were in front of him when he made us. Now, I know this passage is often used 
in debates and regarding, uh, and, and, and as it regards abortion, the murder of children in the mother's womb, if this does not lay the moral foundation and fabric for an argument that says that God loves even those that are in the womb, I don't know what does. You can also combine it if you want more, more uh, uh, arguments. Uh, Jeremiah uh, 1 uh, chapter 5 says, I chose you before I formed you. Notice who's doing the work there. God chose us before he formed us in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. Now, I don't know the pain and the anxiety and the fear of child bearing a child firsthand. I only know it secondhand from D. But nowhere do I see that those emotions, that element, negates the fact that God made and formed us before the beginning of things and that we are his workmanship and that every child should be protected no matter what. Thank you. That, if you're looking for a, something to say amen on, that was a, an appropriate place, I think. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. You planned my life before a single day began. Guys, God's already done it. He's done everything for us. He made us. He formed us. He set us on our path in our life. Now, of course, we have choices that we can make that divert that path. We can choose to sin. We can choose to do other things. But even then, God knows what we're up to. And he loves us nonetheless. And again, David stands in awe of this. He says, when I wake up, I am still with you. Again, that's an allusion to death and an assurance and a reassurance for us when we lose a loved one, when they wake up, if they place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it's just going from awake here to wake there, that he's with you even in death. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that David has come to know. That's the God that I would encourage you to know if you don't today. You, 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 you can't run. You can't hide. You can't live your life in such a way to put up a barrier to God, one that God can't see through. You can't behave in, in a moral way thinking that that is sufficient to satisfy God's wrath at sin. You can't do it because he knew you from the very beginning. You are not a stranger to him. David comes to this realization in these last few verses. <clears throat> he, he has a similar reaction to what Isaiah did that we find recorded in chapter 6 when, when Isaiah sees this vision of God in the temple. He sees God high and lifted up and he sees the magnificence of God, the wonder of who he is and he realizes his own sinfulness. He realizes how sinful he is. You remember what Isaiah says? Isaiah said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. David is at that same point in this psalm that we're about to read. He's just been spending all this time talking about this wonderful God and he realizes who he is and the sin that besets him. And listen to how David deals with it. God, if only you would kill the wicked, you bloodthirsty men, stay away from me, who invoke you deceitfully. Your enemies swear by you falsely. Lord, don't I hate those who hate you and detest those who rebel against you? I hate them with extreme hatred. I consider them my enemies. That's not David taking a left turn from this wonderful recognition of who God is. It is the culmination of that recognition when he sees that he has sin in his life and he's saying, Lord, even if it takes destroying 
the people that are causing me to sin, even if it takes destroying those who swear deceitfully by you, Lord, keep this sin away from me. I don't want to be a part of it, Lord. That's how badly, if you hate somebody because they sin, I'm right there with you, Lord. I want you to know that I'm on your side. I want to be a part of what you're doing. Isaiah said it much more succinctly. David takes a few more words, but the bottom line is this. I recognize that I'm a sinner, and Lord, I need you to do something about it. You see, that's what worship is all about, guys. <clears throat> we come together. We sing God's praises. We recognize who he is. We open up his word so that we can learn about him. And the more we learn about him, the more we learn how great he is and how pitiful we are. And our natural response is to say, Lord, I need you to do something about that. Save me. That's what Isaiah was saying when he said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. That's what David is saying here when he's saying, <coughs> destroy those that cause me to sin. And God comes along and he says, all right. You recall with Isaiah, he sent one of the cherubim down with a burning coal that he placed on his lips. And he was purified. David here says, I consider them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. It's not a burning coal, but he's saying, know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there's any offensive way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. He's saying, Lord, I'm turning my life over to you. Isaiah said the same thing. See, because... The, the culminating part of worship is this, and that is how we respond to God's salvation. The Lord said to Isaiah, Who, whom shall we send? Whom shall go for us? And Isaiah said, I'll go. David says, search me. See if there's anything offensive in me. Lead me in the way you want me to go. So how does this impact our behavior? You say, okay, I think I got it. I think Psalm 139 points out that he knows us inside and out, that he knows everything about me, that everything that I do, he knows beforehand. He knows every word that I say. I get that, and I'm in awe of that. But what do we do when we walk out of here today? What does that mean for us? When we get to work in the morning, do we realize that our Lord is right there with us? When things go wrong around the breakfast table in the morning, anybody ever have anything go wrong at the breakfast table? Or am I the only one? When things go wrong at the breakfast table, our Savior is right there. How is that going to impact the way we deal with, how, with when things go wrong? When we see a reversal in our finances, when we see a reversal in our career path, when we see blocks put out there in front of us, how do we respond? Because the way we respond, people, is important, and I'll tell you why. Our mission is to point people to Jesus one person at a time. That's given to us. In Matthew 28, it's given to us actually in all of the Gospels and in the book of Acts as well. Our mission is to point people to Jesus Christ. And this is to take nothing away from people that stand on street corners and preach the gospel. There's a place for that. But for most of us, if we're going to point somebody to Jesus Christ, it is done through relationships. We build a relationship with a lost person, and then we tell them about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And if this lost person sees us react as a worldly person when things go wrong when we forget about what Psalm 139 tells us, our chances of pointing to them to Jesus Christ begin to diminish because folks, they have to learn to trust us before they can trust Jesus as their Savior. In most instances, they have to be able to trust what we say for them to receive Christ as their Savior. So Psalm 139 matters a lot because it matters what we do. So how are you going to handle this tomorrow morning? <clears throat> Tomorrow's Monday. Things are going to happen. You're going to leave here today. You're going to drive. Things happen when you drive. 
Things happen with illnesses. They, ha they happen uh, at work. They, they happen all over the place. How do you deal with them? Do you approach them from a standpoint of God has already ordained this day for me. He already understands this plan of my life. He knit me together. He knows me from the ground up. And he holds me in his hand. So I'm going to respond in a certain way. Or do we try to throw up a wall and say, you know what, I can do this myself. I don't need God's help. I got myself into this problem. I'll get myself out of it. Have you ever said that? I got myself into this. I'll get myself out. Want to tell me how that worked? Okay. I can give you example exa after example in my own life where I forgot this very simple fact that my God knows me better than I do. And I got to lean on him and rely upon him. So that's why this matters tomorrow. He already knows. He's already been there. He's already done it. And he's good all the time. Maybe you're here today and you've been throwing up walls around your life to the people around you. You've been acting morally correct. You've been acting, unfortunately, out of yourself. And you've never repented of your sins and received Christ as your Savior. Maybe you've done that at work. You've done it with your family. Maybe you've got everybody fooled. Maybe you've even fooled yourself into thinking that God is not watching. If you haven't heard anything else this morning, you've got to understand that God knows everything that's going on in your life and you can't fool him. Maybe you need to come here in a, in a short while and bow on this altar and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. There'll be people here to receive you to do that. Maybe you've done that. But for whatever reason, you've not followed him in believer's baptism. You'll have an opportunity to do that as well. Maybe, maybe you've been attending here for a while, or this may be your first time, and you're looking for a place to plant your life with a group of people that believe that God's word is God's word. It's sufficient for everything. You're under the leadership of a godly pastor and a godly group of people who love you maybe you want to come and make this church your home I don't know what it may be but you're going to have an opportunity to complete this cycle of worship today by responding to what the Lord has laid on your heart through the worship you've already done the realization that God is great that you're not and that you need to do something about it would you stand with me at this time and pray with me. Father, we thank you for your blessings. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to come into this house today. Lord, we realize that it is not by accident that anyone is here today. Father, it's not, it's not us trying to show the world how good we are because that is pointless. It is futile. Because, Father, you know the truth. Lord, I pray especially for those that may be here this morning that have hidden behind whatever walls they've constructed, trying to hide from you, Lord, trying to say that their good behavior and that their morality will save them. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them and that they might know they need to come forward today to pray to receive Christ as their Savior, repenting of their sins and placing all of their faith and trust in Him. Father, I pray for those that have done that but have not yet told the world that they're going to follow you by engaging in believer's baptism. I pray, Father, that, that you might convict them that they need to make that witness to the world. Father, I pray for those that are looking for a place to plant their life and their family in a church with a group of people that take seriously the Great Commission and take seriously that we need to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, Father, because what could be more loving to a lost person than to tell them about Jesus? Father, I pray that you might use this time for your glory and your honor. And in your son's name we pray this, Lord. Amen.